Um, so good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. And um, as you know, this webinar is together with Sahas. And uh, what we're trying to do in this preliminary webinar is demystifying some of the ambiguity from the solar uh, waste management ecosystem. We will start in a couple of minutes. We'll just give everybody five, a couple, another four, five minutes to join in. Um, and then we'll begin. Um, just another reminder that all your questions uh, throughout the webinar, you can post in the Q&A section. Um, we will be looking at them and answering them towards the end of the webinar. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just set the context of why we even decided to do this webinar and where we're coming from. So um, energy, as we all know, has played a vital um, solution to strengthen last mile, especially in case of healthcare, livelihoods across the globe. And we've seen a large uptake of solar uh, deployment and uh, India itself has set a very ambitious target to achieve 450 uh, gigawatt of renewable energy capacity by 2030. And um, one of the larger pieces in the entire waste management ecosystem itself is uh, what happens to the solar uh, panels because their average lifespan is about 20 to 30, uh, 25 to 30 years. And there are currently more than 500 uh, million installed in India. Um, but we also know of innovative solutions that are being worked across in many um, countries. Um, there's a lot happening in France, and they're trying to make sure that they extract and reuse 99% of the unit's uh, components. So that's a target uh, which was quoted in a very recent BBC article. And uh, we also know that in India itself, we have a solar waste management policy. Um, however, it is in a very preliminary um, stage. And um, so those are a couple of interesting facts, but today we have like a powerhouse itself of uh, different experts who have uh, a lot of domain knowledge. So they will be sharing that in the course of the uh, webinar with all of you. Uh, introducing our first panelist, Dr. Dipali Sinha Khetriwal. She's the co-founder and director of EcoWork and has 19 years of experience in the e-waste field and is an internationally recognized expert. She has been instrumental in setting up the e-waste academy under the United Nations University. Um, moving on to our moderator, uh, Divya, Ms. Divya Tiwari. She's the principal scientist and advisor at Sahas and has been with Sahas for close to a decade and is very passionate it's about the circular economy. Our next panelist is Mrs. Shobha Raghavan, who is the chief operating officer of Sahas Zero Waste. She strategizes overall um, operations to ensure growth and scale up of a niche industry and has been associated again with the organization for, the, for a de decade um, and is a CII certified sustainability assessor and acumen fellow. Um, moving on to Dr. Right. S. Suresh Kumar. He's the Associate Vice President EHS of Amara from Amara Raja Group of Companies, has 27 years of experience, um, holds a master's in chemistry along with a doctorate in environment, project management, and industrial hygiene is from Bosch, UK. Um, moving on, we also have Mr. Krishna Rivankar, who's the MD of Balark Solar Private Limited. Um, he has 30 years of experience in the development, management, design, engineering, and manufacturing of so solar photovoltaic cells, modules, power systems, and projects. Um, and as a trainer, he has trained 500 plus entrepreneurs, designers, installers, and maintenance in, uh, engineers in the solar PV business. Um, our last panelist wasn't able to join us today due to an emergency, but he is represented by the communications head at StatCon. Um, Sir is the managing director of StatCon Energia, and he has been working in the power electronics industry for the last 40 years and extremely passionate about sustainable power solutions. So we will hear um, his representation from uh, Charushmita, who's here with us. 
Um, apart from that, we already mentioned that any questions you have, you can put them in the Q&A section. We will be looking at the Q&A section towards the end of the uh, webinar, and there is ample time for that. Um, during the webinar, it will be a QA and a format, which will be moderated by Divya. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ruam. Uh, very warm welcome to all who have joined this session. Uh, as you have heard, we have more than 100 years of experience sitting in this panel, so there is no justification to, for wasting a moment here. So I'll jump in straight. I will uh, start with the youngest person here. We have uh, Charu, but uh, representing an organization with more than a decade of experience in solar industry. Uh, so for everyone to understand the magnitude of this problem that we are discussing today, I think it is important to understand how this industry has progressed in the last few years and how is it likely to grow exponentially. Uh, so Charu, your thoughts on this, if you can give a brief overview. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Charu and thank you Divya for, uh, and uh, Roam for introducing me. Okay, so uh, the company's name is Tatron Energia. We've, uh, we are manufacturers of power electronics and here uh, the relevance is for solar inverters, which we've been manufacturing for 12 to 13 years. Now, uh, the solar industry, of course, uh, Everyone knows in detail by now about it. It's been experiencing uh, rapid growth in the recent years. And it's fueled by increasing global demand as well as demand in India. There are declining costs of technology, many, many kinds of incentives. So of course it's growing. The cost of solar installation is reducing. Uh, technology advancements are growing and tax incentives. Everything is contributing to the growth of this industry. And the market demand is being st uh, st uh, stimulated. But last year alone, there were about 56,000 megawatt of solar that was installed in India. And with each, even if you install one kilowatt of a solar plant, any installer or person who has solar in their home would know that there are uh, only uh, just the bill of material alone is over five pages. So the amount in the kind of the number of components that go into the making of such a complicated product is huge. Metals, PCBs, semiconductors, rubber, plastic, you name it. And the expected lifetime for most solar installations is about 30 years, 25 to 30 years. And that is being optimistic because multiple factors contribute to the early retirement of solar plants as well. Uh, improper installation practices, manufacturing defects, inadequate maintenance, soiling, climatic conditions. So all of these contribute to an early end of life for all the all kinds of solar equipment, all the whole plant. Solar inverters also have an average lifetime of say about 15 years. So even if the conditions are ideal for a solar installation plant to function for 25 to 30 years, this means that most systems will require their inverters to be replaced at least once during their lifetime. And this is bound to create considerable amounts of waste that must be disposed of or dealt with or recycled in the most environmentally safe way possible. Because just going back and reiterating the figure of almost 56 to 57,000 uh, megawatt of solar installations by uh, uh, in 2022 that we had. And by two, uh, 2050, India is expected to be one of the top five leading solar waste producers globally. So top five, I mean, we were still talking about adoption that, oh, when will India adopt? When will there be 100% adoption? And we are already going to be one of the top few solar waste producers globally. So it's, we are, India is expected that if we go by with the same way that we are going in the same manner, and if nothing changes, then we are expected to produce 4 million tons of uh, waste per year from just, just solar PV installations. And this is, I mean, of course, we all agree that this is not the way to handle that. These estimates are definitely subject to change as solar industry continues to expand and more installations are reaching end of life stage. So, and so, I, I mean, just, just to conclude, and this was just a kind of a starting point at the, as, as they had pointed out. And later on, of course, we'll elaborate what we all are doing uh, at our stages. But here, I just want to leave you with a thought that of course, we see a big role for end-of-life management, EVS management of solar equipment. 
but also uh, in this circularity sustainable manufacturing also holds a very big place that should find a way in conversations like these as environmental concerns continue to mount businesses like us are also increasingly prioritizing that even the way we are producing our equipment if we say that okay by solar will change your life why don't you install a solar plant then we also need to produce it in a way that is sustainable so it's the same thing like green hydrogen i would say that uh, the same concept in retrospect we should apply to solar as well so end of life management should have sustainable manufacturing as a very close friend and uh, we are also one of the people who are very focused on that many many companies are now focusing on that and with the recent rules about um, epr uh, i would elaborate on later sections but yes this is the stage we are at and definitely definitely we can change that uh, but if nothing changes then we are going to be one of the biggest solar based producers and we need to change that so over to you dipya thank you so this number of 5 page bomb per kilowatt of power installed will stay with me and i'm sure with all the audience here and you know the fact that there's to recycle so moving to you dipali if you can give an overview of how is the industry the government and uh, the recycling industry responding to it where are we in india with respect to how prepared are we where are we with respect to bracing this issue thanks uh, divya thanks to selco and sars for organizing this i think you know this is something that uh, has been on my mind as i was telling divya for a few years now uh, you know as uh, rao mentioned i started working on the topic of e waste about 18 19 years ago at that time e waste was just a fringe topic the regulations were just coming in in europe and you know that's exactly the same place i see in india right now with solar waste where it's really at that cusp of becoming a big topic it's still not very well known it's still not really given the importance uh, you know i mean we have the ability to really learn from the mistakes we've made with e waste and you know like uh, chand was saying not have to wait for that big tsunami of solar panels to come and hit us and then be scrambling to find a way to to recycle them so you know where we are currently in india is actually trying to uh, do two things at the same time one is on the policy side so i think there has been good progress you know there has been the appetite of the government of the ministry of environment and forest of the ministry of energy uh, renewable energy mnre to really discuss and pick up this topic and it has you know actually brought been brought under the framework of extended producer responsibility which you know I, i'm sure we will talk about a little bit longer and in more detail so that that's really important from a end of life perspective because that gives the impetus for producers for manufacturers to really start thinking on how can they already plan to build in the costs in in terms of the design in terms of the materials all sorts of elements that would impact them as the producers having the responsibility for recycling at end of life so that's one thing on the policy side on the uh, the infrastructure side i think this is something that we still need to pick up uh, you know it's still not something that is there uh, so not globally you know there are still more or less technologies at pilot stage or you know uh, just being commercialized but you know the the the, the thing about uh, having the infrastructure is that you need volume so the minute there are volumes you will find that there is investment coming into that sector so i think that's going to happen i think you know now having the backing of the legislation having you know the volumes ticking up because now we've had the history of solar in india for the last you know 18 19 20 years uh, so we have had people uh, you know i i know i've had uh, calls with people who who have 10000 20000 kind of panels to dispose of right now these are being taken by the informal sector mainly interested in the 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 frame which is aluminum which has a good value so there is some money uh, that you can get from recycling these uh, uh these, these end of life panels but you know if we think of it in a completely circular economy uh, perspective i would say that first we should look at reusing those panels whether you know even if they are not efficient as efficient as they were before 
can they be used in applications that doesn't require that efficiency? And I think, you know, here, especially where you have utility scale solar, you know, we have these huge solar farms and, you know, maybe they are incentivized to, uh, you know, change their panels because, you know, repowering is a fairly uh, common practice in many countries where, uh, you have more efficient panels, you have your uh, rates already locked in. So the more power you produce, the better it is, right? So with the same footprint, if you have a more efficient panel, uh, it makes business sense to replace an old panel, which is not as efficient. So that repowering would mean that, you know, there is a faster or there's an acceleration of the waste stream. But if we can use this in an alternative use in you know areas which don't need that kind of efficiency, I think that's a real win because you can extend the life and actually fully you utilize that 20, 25, 30 year of that solar panel. The second thing is you know on the recycling. Now solar panels, they even if you know uh, they're not being repowered, you might have hay, you might have other natural uh, causes. You know the, they break, they have you know a very uh, delicate uh, plastic film, sometimes they crack. So there are many reasons why solar panels fail. And if they do need to be recycled, uh, a large, you know, almost 70, 80% of the, the, the weight of the panel is in the glass. If we can find really good solutions, good circular solutions to, you know, take that glass, which is very, very high quality glass, and put them back into solar panel manufacturing. Currently, we have 95% of our solar panels being imported. You know, can that be a way to actually, you know, start that, you know, really kickstart that PLI scheme in solar kind of uh, to get it back, to reuse that material? And, and how can, you know, it already be designed in a way that is possible to, to reuse the glass? Because that glass is high quality, you know, silicon, uh, you know, is getting expensive. It's, it's difficult. It needs a very high priority. So obviously all the, the life cycle costs of actually manufacturing that panel would be so much more optimized. So, um, so you know, so I think you know there are many benefits if you look at it from a circular economy perspective. The more you can, you know, use and extend the light panel in the first place, and uh, you know, develop the infrastructure to also recycle it better and more circular. This does not exist currently, so we do need investment. We do need research on that. Uh, so that's that's a little bit the current landscape right now. I hope that gives a little bit of a flavor on that we are over to you please definitely definitely we'll dig deeper into the things that you've talked about uh, but uh, staying with this whole idea of circularity uh, as charu said the the first step is to design better products so i would ask uh, mr devanka with you know 40 years of experience what are your thoughts what can be the key design changes uh, material changes in the solar uh, equipment uh, space which can make them more sustainable and circular Good afternoon to all. Uh, see, uh, everybody uh, are talking about uh, expanding the life of solar module and reliability of the solar module and then uh, how well it can perform over its lifetime. Does it achieve a end of the life uh, at some point of time? All these things. Actually, uh, in the manufacturing of solar module, uh, there are so many criteria, so many standards which have been um, used now for ensuring that the product uh, uh, performs well throughout its life uh, and it performs reliably. Uh, and uh, some point of time we are saying, okay, if you ask a product uh, manufacturer, he says that this is the warranty of the product what I give. And uh, I think uh, solar module is the only product in the in all our product what we use uh, gives a warranty of uh, nowadays 30 years of uh, performance warranty and uh, 12 years of uh, product warranty. That is what every manufacturer, most of the manufacturers are claiming. And uh, while doing so, it would have gone through uh, various uh qualification tests as well as uh, reliability tests to see that okay whatever has been warranty is uh, is uh, provided so we have many iec standards uh, for uh, manufacturing or uh, supplying of solar modules so if you see iec 61215 is that which is a 
design qualification and type approval uh, standard, uh, which is a basic standard that any solar module manufacturer anywhere in the world, if he has to supply anywhere in the world, that this is the first certification that has to go through and then it has to pass. Okay, so then you have uh, 61730 as a safety standard because it is a it is a product that will be either sitting on the roof of the building and generating electricity. So it has to be safely implemented, safely handled, safely. It has to work safely without any uh, danger. So all those safety aspects have been uh, taken care and a standard has been brought in. And all the solar modules, uh, whether it is produced in India, Japan, China, anywhere, it has to go through this basic two standards so it has to be certified for that then we have uh, we will come out and say that okay we are going to put solar modules closer to the coastal area where it is a salty atmosphere and uh, the salt level is higher so there is a another standard which has come salt mist corrosion testing so modules have to pass through that uh, uh, salt mist corrosion then we may say that okay we may install solar module on the top of a cattle shed and a lot of ammonia getting released by the cattle and then uh, so whether the solar module can withstand that uh, ammonia corrosion testing exam. Now earlier we were producing solar modules that were suitable for either 12 volts application or 24 volts application and Slowly, when we started moving towards the grid connected system, the voltage levels have gone up to 600 volts DC. And all the components that has to be suitable for withstanding that 600 volts DC as a system voltage, slowly it has been moved to 1000 volts now. And now we have increased it to 1500 volts. So a 1500 volts DC voltage is, I think, uh, 10 times severe than 11 kV uh, uh, voltage shock it can give. It is a very dangerous one. So the product has to meet that requirement. It has to safely work in all weather conditions. Okay. Now, when we come to a manufacturing company and when we go to a, a solar module manufacturer, he produces so many documents to say that, okay, exactly in line with whatever the standards my product has passed through, I, we are going through that process. So there will be a standard process, there will be a standard bill of material, there is standard bill of quantities, how I'm going to test the solar module, what is the quality plan I have, and uh, what is my guaranteed technical particulars of my product. All those details are very clearly defined and then it will be given to a, a buyer who wants to buy solar module. And uh, it covers both physical characteristic, electrical characteristics, mechanical, what weather condition it can withstand in different, because a solar module that has been produced in India should be suitable for working in, in uh, Himalayan area or very high temperature anywhere in the world it should be served. so clearly it says that what weather conditions it will be working how the output of a solar module will vary with the temperature and uh, what all the iec certification it has been done and the what all the warranty terms of a product because it's a long long term uh, association that we are going to have it with the manufacturer so warranty terms then how we are going to manufacture the entire manufacturing process, uh, module classification, because it is a it is a product that will be producing electricity for from from today to next 25, 30 years. So uh, very clearly how it will behave at different temperature condition, weather conditions, all those things, all details will be available packing details, how it can be unloaded, how it has to be handled at site. All these details will be available to the vendor, uh, to the customer who can, who are interested in buying, only to ensure that he should be 
satisfied to buy that material and then use it in for his application now if i go further on to that so there are uh, the modules uh, when they go through iec certification very clearly it will go through the twist test hailstorm wind load how much wind load it can take how what size of hail it can withstand take the impact because all the modules and all are toughened with the toughened glass whether it can withstand all these things everything is very clearly defined and then uh, it is produced okay yes so mr Now, divankar you know it is becoming very clear that it's a very difficult product uh, which is subjected to some very difficult uh, i would say performance demands in terms of conditions in which it operates and also the standards it need to meet yeah. it needs to meet for short term and long term performance so clearly that is you know that is coming out and it's very interesting to hear the specifics that you have told uh, and you know uh, it it poses the challenges for the industry to how to bring in the criteria for additional criteria for sustainability and circularity beyond the long list that you already Correct. have okay. yeah, yeah. yeah i just want to add one yeah. more thing that okay the warranty for the product the performance warranty is given for 30 years let's say now nowadays all solar modules are available with 30 years uh, warranty and what they say is that today whatever is the wattage of that solar module at the end of 30 years it will not be the reduction will not be more than 15 or 20% 20%. of its original capacity so that means it is still with 80% of its uh, performance capacity and if we need not call that it is the end of uh, life of the solar module uh, i am already experienced with my rooftop system which has been working for last 22 years and i have been using it in my house so modules will continue to work it's only that uh, the other panelist uh, when she said that okay either it can be used for a different application if we think that existing application requires a higher efficiency and higher wattage modules and things like that so that is what i want to tell thank you thank you so much you know yeah. as we can actually do one panel dedicated to just this aspect okay. of how you know how complex it will be to bring in additional sustainability and circularity criteria on such already existing demands on performance yeah. now you know we have all been talking about solar panels but one another very prominent component of the solar industry are the batteries uh, yeah. so i'll move to dr suresh and ask him to give some insights on to how these batteries are these batteries identical to ev vehicles and with ev becoming uh, so uh, you know widely uh, being uh, available and those batteries coming for recycling are there synergies in the recycling infrastructure for the batteries in solar industry and ev batteries will this be of any advantage in improving recyclability you are on mute uh, dr suresh if you could unmute please yeah so thank you good afternoon to all of you uh coming back to the batteries yes so far ev batteries is now upcoming market so for even for solar panel we are going with lead acid batteries only that itself we are having lot of challenges on the recycling specifically on collection of batteries because it is been distributed oems specifically on solar panels it is going with different vendors while it is collecting back the batteries itself it is a very challenging one on the uh, specific to lead acid batteries if we come into the ev batteries so far recycling units are very minimum the technology is not 100% if you talk about circular economy for lithium ion batteries it is not it and it is not a proven recycling technologies available in india uh, still we are in the Uh, only one unit which are doing not in the proven way which is going on even amar raja we are setting up ev batteries of 9500 crore new plant in hyderabad so we are also thinking of to setting up lithium recycling plant within our facility similarly we have we are the one of the top most lead acid battery manufacturing we are setting up lead 
recycling lead, lead acid battery recycling plant but the presently available lead acid recycling plant having lot of challenges and a lot of environmental impacts which is being given to the society and too much of occupational health and safety concerns are there the people whom they are working even in the formal lead recycling plants the llb levels are too high and no tracking no isolation over there if you can visibly go and see the plants are having 2 cm to 10 cm thickness of lead dust people are working and it is not a proper air pollution control technologies proper segregation now if you can take uh, even lead acid batteries batteries recycling people's only talking about which is the valuable material which they can able to get profit they will concentrate only on that product so we are talking on the circular economy but people's mostly talking about if lead acid battery they are more focus on lead what about acid what about the plastics so if 100% recycling actually lead acid battery recycling we have units we have the proven technologies we can go 90 to 95% of the products can be recycled back and reused back into the battery manufacturing so uh, as amaraja we are started doing that one even sulfuric acid we are doing desulfurization and making as sodium sulfate and sodium sulfate is going to the by product for the other manufacturing industries as raw material and all these plastics is recycling there are colors of the plastics which we can able to do ir sorter and sorting out and take that on specific color of battery packages we can able to make so concern is on the circular economy on the recycling we are far behind compared to the other countries we need to be focus more on this on recycling better so more focus on manufacturing not on the recycling but we need to be more on the recycling pattern not as a recycling means a simple recycling facility it should be 100% on circular economy and uh, taking care of environment as well as the occupational okay. health and safety this is the uh, most important things and the upcoming things i can explain you in detail on further things so thank you thank you dr suresh so yeah this is of concern that you, although battery uh, lead acid battery recycling is considered a very uh, picture perfect case of uh, recycling recycling numbers are very high and it is given as a very good example of closed loop recycling and driven uh, extensively by epr norms also because the battery recycling norms had come long ago so uh, moving to epr impact on any new industry uh, which is looking to drive circularity and recycling i'll move to shobha who has extensive experience in uh, driving epr uh, on the ground for plastic and e-waste so shobha what are your thoughts you know how has epr played a role in recycling and in case of designing better products uh, and do you think it can play an important part in case of solar sector also we can't hear you shobha no no you're not on mute but we can't hear you i'll come back to you shobha just try it you keep uh, trying and we will respond back to you if we hear from you i'll uh, move to dipali in the meanwhile dipali back to you in terms of uh, specifics around uh, what do you think should be done fundamentally we should change fundamentally whether in terms of technology uh, financial support to this industry to with respect to recycling 
and uh, designing better products and also the regulatory framework what do you think needs to be done to address this sure. thanks Divya. maybe before i jump into that question uh, you know i i thought uh, dr suresh kumar gave a really extensive answer about all the the complications and the and the, the challenges um, for the lead acid battery recycling and then you know they are similar for collection i think is really the crux and actually that leads to my answer because i think once we can in establish a collection network you know once we can ensure that the materials are brought back uh, into a stream which is able to handle it sufficiently uh, safely uh, that's when we can really start to make that difference, start to have that circularity in build. And, and, you know, there's not one silver bullet. You know, you need the policy because that has to, you know, be the driver that is normally creating the, the business case for investment that is really creating the compliance requirements for producers. Because everywhere in the world, you know, this is true for plastics, this is true for electronics, uh, to do the recycling in, in the best proper, in the safest way way you need to have additional money now no producer says oh you know i want to you know not include the cost of transport to the retailer i don't want to pay the retailer to sell my goods you know that is understood that you need to have a business incentive so in the same way you need the business incentive for someone to collect the material you need someone to you know transport it and someone to recycle it and this funding comes through epr and you know this has been really something that has been tried and tested in many different parts of the world uh, and you know for different material streams so just to create that funding mechanism is really important because then you have a way to make sure that there is an incentive for every part of that reverse value chain you know just as you have it for the forward value chain you also need it for the reverse value chain and i see in the questions uh, you know there was also some questions on incentives for the users uh, how do they you know have the um you know, that that motivation to give it to the right channel, how do they have the motivation to actually do the right thing after they collect it back as well, right? So uh, I think that that's something that would be important to keep in mind, uh, both from, you know, whether it's technology, you need to invest in it, whether it's a collection network, whether it's the recycling itself, because you, you need to have a plant, you need to use energy, you need to have people. Uh, so there are those operational costs, capital costs that need to be taken care of. And this funding needs to come from uh, the product itself. And typically that that's, you know, uh, something that has been true for all products, including mobile phones, including laptops, you know, which are very, very high gold content products, right? So typically you would say, hey, you know, there's so much of gold, can, can it not pay for itself? That's not true. So for products that, you know, need much more effort to collect, you know, if it's specially decentralized, you know, you have these off-grid rooftop solar in, you know, the hilly areas, for example. I mean, you know, there is, you know, a huge cost involved in just collection. But that is necessary because you need to, you know, make sure that it is collected and transported. And uh, and, and that's that's really coming from the funding mechanism. So tying it all together, you need to really work on multiple <coughs> kind of channels rather than just there's one, you know, single bullet for that. Correct. So one is obviously supporting with the uh, transportation cost. The other is also identifying uh, industrial manufacturing synergies, like Dr. Suresh was saying that, you know, the uh, H2SO4 being converted into Na2SO4 and that being used as a feed for another industry. I think those, uh, some of those links getting established uh, would also help in improving the uh, revenue inflow into recycling, which is important. Uh, Shobha, uh, can you, can you now, can you just check if you can? Yeah, Devia, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we uh, can hear you. Good, good. Okay, good. thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, maybe uh, Shobha, you can just start with the expansion of EPR. People may not know we have been uh, term. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, uh, extended producer responsibility, and um, I think it's good that uh, EPR is uh, extended into uh, solar panels. And I think that there's a lot of learning for India. Last seven, eight years, we have done plastics and electronic waste, and what EPR is really uh, uh, EPR for any waste material has really taught us that how do we decode this whole new monster? Whichever, is, whichever new stream of space is coming into the system, how do you decode it? What's the type of solar panel? What are the associated batteries? We, the Developing entire technical expertise 
around this entire uh, market of solar panel to see its reusability, understanding the recyclability of the material, focusing on resource recovery, understanding costs and revenues associated with this uh, new material type, a different material categorization and its conversion factor, size of this entire new market coming out of solar waste. That also, uh, right now, we don't even have like e-waste and plastic. We kind of know through different baseline studies and, and reporting by the manufacturer. This is the amount of tons of waste that uh, is in the system. But right now, I don't think we have a, uh, num num a quantity for the amount of solar waste. Um, understanding end of life of different types of solar panels and uh, who are the different players. The entire data and documentation involved for the traceability to bring about the circular economy is something that this EPR, uh, I believe, is going to bring structure into and increasing the recycler capabilities. Right now, it's very, very raw. 95 to 98 percent are dismantlers. But what are additional infrastructure is required to, uh, uh, to uh, dismantle and recycle uh, the parts coming out of the uh, uh, solar waste? And the uh, most important are these institutional customers or consumers who have actually installed a solar couple of uh, maybe a decade back coming from outside India and other countries and some in-house uh, uh, understanding. Uh, I mean, that we've already understood that this waste is now ready for uh, recycling, but uh, we, uh, we have no mechanism uh, to explain to them what is the storage uh, facility, and they have already started informally dismantling these uh, these uh, products. So all of this, along with this unified system of connecting the entire supply chain, these are going to be the benefits EPR is going to bring uh, coming into solar waste. And this is a great learning. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to understand this whole bit of solar waste. Out to you, Divya. Yeah, thank you, Shobha. So yeah, Dr. Suresh, you have a point to add. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, just to, I want to add a few points yeah. over there in the EPR specific yeah. to battery recycling. Yes. yes, we have EPR for waste battery collection, but still we don't have the clear regulations by the MOEF. Still the discussions are going on because they are giving the targets on dry weight basis. Okay. What about sulfuric acid? Okay. If you take lithium ion battery, what about the NMP? So, and in the regulation, if you are going for, if I want to set up a lead acid battery recycling plant, so people are showing only to recovery the lead, either refining and rotary furnace, this process. What about the other product? Mm -hmm. Why we should not to insist if any recycling plant it should be on all the product should be recycled right. and the recycling also the recycled product should be used to remanufacture the same product recycling it does not mean that if i am making a contaminated product we cannot able to use back into the process we don't have any clear regulations we have the guide uh, guidelines and notifications nowhere in the recycling plant these aspects are mentioned in EPR, if we can bring waste battery or e-waste, so everywhere on dry weight basis we are giving. On dry weight basis, if I want to give, I have to give as dump batteries. What about sulfuric acid it will go? What about the other processes we need to be concentrate on? What about the targets which we are giving? We have up to 2030, 100% battery collections. <coughs> so what about the upcoming years? If uh, now this year I need only 30% battery collection, what about 70% battery of which I am <coughs> where it will go? So these five years impact, environmental impact, what will happen for or how this will prolong this contamination or this toxicity to the next 10 years? So how need to be addressed on this? So EPR still it is not a constructed notification or guideline. It is just uh, initial phase they throw into that uh, industries. You collect something, do something. Waste battery collection, it had come very long back. Long ago, yes. So no rules there that whether you have collected or not, people used to submit the forms. But now EPR comes, yes, everybody is come forward, but still it needs to be fine-tuned on. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, 
This is what very very heartening to hear this. A producer asking for tightening of a rule, uh, asking for more clarification, asking for elements which actually make it circular and not just focus on the collection target. So very happy to hear this, and I'm sure you are uh, saying this with a position of authority, having achieved some of these things in your plan. So it'll be very interesting to get more details on this. I'll move to the other big part of the uh, component bomb, which Charu had mentioned, is the inverter. So how how is the inverter looking like with respect to its circularity assessment? And what is the industry doing to make it more sustainable? Okay. Uh, thanks, Sivya. So first of all, I would just want to say that uh, Dr. Dipali mentioned a very important point about incentivizing the user, and I'll come to that. So inside the solar inverter, I mean, we have plastics, which are about 0.44% of the whole weight of the inverter, probably. Metal is about 60%. The PCB assemblies and all are, say, about 39%. And then the cable and rubber are about 1 point something percent together. So when we are looking at uh, what are the components, what are the subcomponents, how do we recycle them or reuse them or outsource it for someone to dispose them of? So we have a number of measures in place at the moment. Uh, first, and uh, my favorite one is that we reuse parts for uh, making our furnitures and different kinds of accessory objects as well inside the company. So the solar panels, because we were also doing projects earlier, we had some solar panels even on the rooftop of our factory, which were damaged. So what we did was we made huge tables out of it because as uh, 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 Sarah had said earlier, it is very, very sturdy. So we got them to make tables out of them. We got battery casings uh, and we made planters out of them gave, as gifts to everyone. We used uh, uh, our uh, PCBs, the scrap ones for making boxes, organization cells and so on. But of course, that is not scalable when we talk about the issue at hand. So what we started doing was that we were using components from our uh, old um, inverters for testing and development purposes as well. So we started whatever uh, uh, the faulty components or uh, things like that would come up, up from our customers. We would optimize that resource and use it for testing, training purposes, development purposes, prototyping purposes, all of these. Even our old models of inverters, which had, of course, huge metal enclosures, uh, the prototypes of that, they are, we also use it to uh, train people on to make testing jigs, to make covers of different kinds of inverters and circuitry. So in all this, this was all done to promote circularity that whatever we can use inside, we use that. And our uh, quality assurance department, they are also uh, uh, all they are also involved in promoting circularity. So they are there at every step to see what is usable and what is not usable. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to material that is usable, fine, we use it in-house. Now, what about the large scale material that we are unable to use? So we have uh, we are still uh, finalizing our tie up with an e-waste management agencies because we realize that if we really want to scale up this initiative and fulfill our EPR, uh, if we want to create an EPR target for ourselves and you want to fulfill that, then we need to ensure that proper disposal, disposal of the parts that cannot be used anymore, they must follow strict environmental regulations to prevent uh, harm to the ecosystem. So responsible disposal, we realize that there are agencies that handle end to end rather than giving it to a local metal scrap dealer. It is better to give it to someone who knows how and when to use it and who are the people who can reuse it, how to dispose them of, how to recycle them. So we were quite impressed with that. So this is an expertise that only such kind of agencies have. At some point, though, we would like to have an in-house team like Suresh has for battery recycling and plant. We would want to dedicate a whole department to this. And uh, But as manufacturers, as Suresh had said, that it is difficult to convince uh, consumers that if we start refurbishing some parts or if we start buying back, taking back the material, then uh, even if we are ready to give the warranty, it is sometimes difficult because it becomes a social and political problem uh, that somehow in the psyche uh, of people, uh, it is still not fresh, a fresh product, which is 
certified by something because all the fresh products are certified by say some of our inverters they're certified by bis and different so a lot of certifications also take a hit there so that mindset also needs to change and we as manufacturers are just one part of those whole stakeholder ecosystem that can help in that we would love to collaborate with various power electronics and inverter companies as well to work on buyback or to develop take back policies and to extract and reuse valuable metals and other components from solar inverters that are probably decommissioned or uh, probably in a lot of cases, the customer, they later realize that, oh, maybe I don't need a five kilowatt system for my future needs. I actually need a 15 kilowatt system. So they either add or they replace that. And those inverters are also good enough. So there is a lot that can be used. And we are we want to collaborate with other similar companies as well, and also some of our customers, so that we can also get feedback from them. That okay, what you know, just to get an idea of what are you okay with, what parts if we change will you be okay to buy if we offer this kind of warranty. So working with industry partners, manufacturers, stakeholders to develop a standardized process and guidelines for this. Um, and then there is also, as I said, a lack of awareness and lack of system about secondhand inverters or refurbished inverters. So if we are more, if the users are more aware of the technology and how it can be reused effectively, uh, that would be uh, beneficial. Like in countries like Australia, the first uh, option for the manufacturers is to buy back and sell the inverters to a third party solar installer on, on online marketplaces, just like uh, some of the other electronic items that we sell. And uh, many medium scale solar power plants, they just replace their inverters when they reach the end of life. So they resell it, they refurbish it and the practice is quite common there. But the challenge is again, the certifications and the social mindset. Another thing that we do for this is we make um, modular sub assemblies. So whenever we design our product, we make it in a way that sub assemblies are uh, assembled, not just assembled separately, but they are easily repairable and they are easily extractable when we want to uh, uh, say if we if there is an old inverter and we want to use some of the components. So it becomes easier for the assessor to see what components can be reused, what cannot be reused. So when the product is designed since the last uh, few years, we have been working on it that how can we design the products in a way that when it reaches, when it fulfills uh, its life, then how does one assess what part is usable and what is not usable? So we also need to work on, uh, we are working on how to reduce that time of that kind of assessment for easier disassembling, for easier re recycling as well as repair. And, uh, <clears throat> and another important part of this process would be how to track and trace these parts that go elsewhere. So if there are certain parts of your inverter uh, that you would want to be traced, so we could talk to these agencies that while you're disposing, is there a way that we could find out where these, from time to time, we as manufacturers must do a random check as, as an extended producer responsibility that proper documentation is done and that there is an accountability of that kind of responsible uh, disposal. Otherwise, we might just want that, okay, let us, now it is up to them. Now we are not bothered. So uh, that if we if we won't be bothered, then there would be no continuous improvement and innovation in these processes. So all we want to say is that we can help as manufacturers in a lot of such processes, what can be used, what cannot be used, but we would require help from the government in, uh, for certifications and helping the user understand the incentives. And from other agencies, we would need help for uh, them to uh, spread awareness to people on how it's not a bad thing to be using a pre-loved inverter. So that is all from my side. Yeah, you're on mute, yeah. please. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I said thank you so much, uh, Charu, for giving the very interesting insights into the whole uh, process of inverter recycling. Uh, Shobha, I'll come back to you on the, uh, I believe you are servicing some EPR uh, contracts. So how is the industry uh, responding to this uh, recent regulation and what has been your experience of executing such contracts? Yeah, Divya. So uh, even before EPR came, there have been a lot of queries uh, from, the, from these bulk consumers 
and uh, because there are there are a lot of unknowns now with epr coming the unknowns have increased because it's coming in the form of a regulation or a hammer on them and uh, 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 they, earlier and even now i think the responsibilities of these bulk consumers are unclear they don't understand the re regulations because first time first time they are facing a epr uh, uh, epr uh, uh, framework so th they don't realize how deep and intense uh, epr regulations can be they have no idea of the recycling technologies they have no idea of the recyclers uh, they also uh, the biggest problem is the very crude storage at site so when they uh, when they remove the uh, solar panels for change or uh, 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 whatever reasons they are changing the um, what is happening is there's a lot of breakage at site even before we go and um, uh, take a site visit and some of these are really large and then handling these uh, solar panels uh, moving it from site to a uh, to a truck uh, we've had issues with um, uh, handling it uh, i mean danger to our uh, laborer and resulting in breakage of of the glasses uh, sometimes the metals can hurt because they're pretty sharp sometimes the metals are removed inverters are removed so it is it is actually a little a lot of uh, chaos and even when we are trying to uh, talk to them about, okay, it's going to cost so much, uh, we also are not in a position to, uh, uh, to tell them that this is going to be a cost because you, based on the size and the videos we get uh, uh, at initial inspection, we think it's a, it's a, let's say a 10 feet vehicle, but then what happens is actually all the glasses break and then it can actually go into a much smaller vehicle. And then our costs are questions, the customer doesn't pay for costs, then it ends up in a loss. So right now it's right economically, uh, 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 I would say a disaster because neither we as a PRO nor the consumer nor the recycler knows what what, what is coming out of that uh, 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 load that is there at site. So I believe that this EPR is going to first give, uh, needs to uh, open out awareness and training to every player in the system, right from the consumer to recycler to manufacturer to PROs to all other players who are uh, moving the uh, waste and assessing the waste and opening out the waste and 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 then only this market is going to uh, pick up so till then there's going to be a lot of chaos because of the big unknowns on to you divya yeah so as usual sahajiro is struggling with the first mover disadvantage you bear the brunt of trying these things out and uh, you know but i'm sure uh, i'm sure like other things have polished up this will also improve and people will be more uh, they will be able to, you know, plan things better and figure it out. I'll uh, add, uh, add uh, you know, kept the last question for uh, Mr. Devankar because of the depth of knowledge that you have in the sector. So uh, any specific insights, uh, Mr. Devankar, how do we address, how do we overall improve the sustainability and circularity in the sector? Any specific inputs you can give to the panelists here and in, even the audience? Okay, uh, first thing is that uh, we have a big market. It is going to be bigger. It is going to be bigger and bigger because uh, the target what has been set for 2030 is 500 gigawatt. And in that uh, close to about 248 gigawatt will be coming from solar. Okay, so the balance are wind plus uh, bio and hydro and things like that will go. But then the market is going to be big. Uh, there is no doubt in that and uh, India has declared by 2020 it will be net zero. So that means uh, renewable is going to contribute hugely on achieving that target and uh, it is important. Okay, first thing is that we are going to have a big market. There is uh, absolutely no doubt in that. Only thing is that uh, uh, country is taking a lot of steps in uh, taking this forward so that the, the, the market and the target uh, can be achieved uh, uh, rigorously and then there's no problem on that. But only thing is that uh, um, reliability of uh, or what we are seeing is that, uh, just giving an example, uh, earlier a manufacturer used to produce solar modules when only he gets an order and for that particular order he will decide based on what price he has got it he will decide what should be the bom or the bill of material for that product always there used to be a case where 
if the prices are lower, he used to go for a lower quality subcomponents, and then he will make the module and supply. So surely it would have been failing in the field. But now what happened is that for last many years, every manufacturer has got full capacity. They are running all through the years. And when they do that, unless they finalize the source of material, the vendors who will supply for the entire year's requirement. So once this is happening, so what happens is the product output, final output product, which is coming out to be a reliable product. And they always want to be in line with whatever the certification that has happened. So the products are becoming reliable. There is no doubt at all. Only from the government side, if we have a consistent policies for uh, facilitating uh, the improvement in the market, market development, there are so many uh, earlier we used to have a difficulty in getting the um, funds for implementing the project that is getting sorted out. A lot of uh, different financial models are coming and then we would not have thought that, okay, such a model can work out and also it has come. It is facilitating people to go in for renewable energy and awareness also has to increase because uh, on the recycling uh, uh, part of the module, if you see, uh, I am told that the recovery rate is uh, greater than about 95%. And for, for others' understanding, I would like to say that, okay, if the solar module per megawatt is costing about, uh, let's say today it is about 2.2 crores, close to about 70 lakhs rupees worth of recycling is possible. That means approximately 30 to 33 percent or 35 percent of what you have invested it can be collected back so just uh, for people's understanding i'm saying that about for every megawatt of recycling you do of a module you can collect about 70 lakh worth of or value of that uh, product that so is. that is uh, this thing so this awareness has to come the people and then the user so that the more and more rice recycling plants will come into the country because today we do not have much of recycling uh, plants i think it's only as somebody said that it will be collected it will be dismantled and whatever that can be immediately can be used like a aluminum frame and all that are being used but then as such real recycling is not happening so I think more and more industry should come forward to do this because it's a it's a big task and it's a it is not it is not something like a, it's a loss making proposition. It's going to be a very um, financially viable proposition to go in for uh, recycling and also this is what I want to say. This is a very optimistic number, Mr. Krishna. We would definitely like to get the details of the 70 lakhs yeah, because yes. I don't think any other industry, even automobile, has this kind of uh, recycling value potential. And if solar has it, then, you know, this things, yeah. things yeah. look very optimistic. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, we will conclude the discussion here. We want to keep sufficient time for the question uh, answer session. But I just, uh, hearing all of you, I had uh, this thought uh, playing in the back of my mind that this is an ideal industry which can go with this whole idea of product servitization. It's a product which is high value. It's a product which is long life. It's a product which has a very high recycling potential as you have called it out. So, and then the moment you have this phenomena that you are leasing out the equipment to the consumer and not really selling it, then the barriers which Charu also talked about that the consumer has this mindset that I don't want to use a reuse product. But if you are putting out a product which you own, uh, they are just using it like a rental and you are giving a quality assurance, which you are already doing through the warranty frameworks. I feel if this can be explored as a way of business model rather than selling solar panels, uh, it will address a lot of the issues which we are talking out, talking about and open opportunities, you know, be it battery recycling. Because once the product is owned by the manufacturer or the parts are owned by the manufacturer, then the kind of effort that you will put in in designing better products and ensuring it is recycled properly, 
uh, will completely change that rather than when you sell it out. So uh, if we have time, I'll definitely like to hear all of your thoughts on this aspect, but I would uh, now open it out, Ram, for Q&A. I can already see 11 questions here. But Archana, whether you want to, uh, you know, uh, put it out, who's you, if you can, yeah. Uh, Ron, do you want to read out the questions or should I just, I think the panelists are also seeing the questions. Sure. Uh, so there was, uh, yeah, well, how do you want to do it? Um, I think we can read it out. Yeah. yeah. So there was one question on decentralized systems, which is a cause of concern. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure who would want to take it about the difficulties in take back and how do we really manage uh, the waste generated from these de decentralized uh, solar uh, Installation. Maybe it's over. you can talk about decentralized. Uh, this is decentralized recycling or decentralized production. Oh, this is take back. I think they're saying waste management. How could it be done efficiently for decentralized systems? As the present ecosystem does not support it, where shall we start? Is what they're asking. Okay. Uh, Shoba, you want to comment on it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Divya, uh, right now the. Um, ecosystem is uh, again uh, very unclear because the size of panels for example with e-waste we are very clear a washing machine a fridge these are the sizes this is the amount of space it occupies now with this uh, because this has got a, a fragile component in it now um, bringing uh, bringing a decentralized system for storage of uh, from different sites i think would be the first uh, first uh, aspect and uh, then from then on move to uh, a, a state or city wide recycler would be the uh, the best way of handling it and uh, once the ecosystem is understood better and and a lot of training goes on how this can be stored safely if at all it can be stored safely then maybe it can directly be shipped shipped from the site to uh, to a recycler thus reducing a lot of uh, logistics and uh, handling costs and other dangers involved in uh, handling it but right now i see only storage uh, from a storage angle there is a decentralization possible uh, storage and aggregation i would say okay okay the next question is from ashwarya jain she's asking does the warranty specify if the panel can be used or uh, this is to mr krishna revankar i think it, uh, yes, you were yes. talking about different uh, specifications uh, so she's saying, does the warranty uh, specify if the panel can be used for all or some weather situations? Uh, say, uh, could it be used the same one which is used in high temperature? Can it also be used in the cold? No. no. Uh, can I can I reply that? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. okay. Actually, solar modules are uh, uh, produced and they are suitable for a variety of weather uh, conditions. Uh, the temperature, if you take temperature itself, it says it is suitable for minus 40 degrees to plus 85 degrees. Okay. I don't see anything, any other application where you have out of this range, uh, you can, uh, you, you will have a situation. So anywhere, any application in the world, it will be within these temperature ranges okay. so modules are suitable for that second thing maybe if there is a, a heavy wind wind so solar modules uh, can take uh, on the front side uh, about 551 kg per cent meter square of load and back side it can take about 240 kg per meter square load for example if the solar modules are installed on a in a place where it is heavily snowing and uh, the snow load that is sitting on the solar module it has to take that load and uh, without breaking it it has to so something like this all uh, different uh, weather conditions this has been designed and uh, it can take uh, different uh, conditions very well Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram. I think, Archana, there's one interesting question on incentivization yeah, to users nice. for recycling the non-functional materials. And if there's any existing code on this. So, um, Divya and Archana, we can open this out to the panel. I'm sure there's an answer somewhere. Yeah, so this is incentivizing want to, comment? to users Dipali, for recycling non-functional materials. 
so yeah, i think incentive we can talk in. about general for everything not just yeah not just non functional or functional yeah anything on this existing right now so i think you know that's uh, a little bit uh, the the job of extended producer responsibility it's to create the financing mechanism to drive money which is the best incentive most people uh, you know respond to that much better than anything else so or having that economic incentive along with you know carrots and sticks and you know the good of the heart and you know creating awareness all of that is needed and you know the epr financing helps with that as well but at the end of the day you need to build in the cost of access to waste and this is true you know in especially in in um, in, in countries like india everybody understands that there is a value to waste so you always sell waste whether it's the rugby paper whether it's electronics whether it's a mobile phone you know you exchange it or whatever you try to extract the best value and that is the incentive in a way that you know if you can pay for accessing that waste then you have a way to actually bring it to a system which is then able to handle it and treat it properly so you know the incentive is coming from that financing mechanism and when you are setting up those fees the 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 the, the kind of costs you know these are fractions of course from from electronic waste uh, you know from epr and e waste we know that the price that the cost of epr is in a few percentage point like less than a percent for you know most products you know if you are paying 30 40 50000 dollars for a product it, you don't mind paying 100 200 rupees to make sure that it is recycled properly right so we talk those kinds of costs that would needed to be uh included in the price of a product which would then help it be collected and recycled and that would include that incentive as well to you know encourage that consumer to bring it to a convenient location because it has the right infrastructure bring give it to the give a financial incentive to the consumer to exchange for example uh, an old with a new so many many things like that uh, they 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 can be then built in into that financing mechanism to drive that incentive I hope that answers the question uh, from the audience. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Mr. Devankar has raised his hand. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, uh, see, uh, solar modules when they have been installed on the system, and uh, at some point of time, it would have been removed for various reason. Maybe the customer would not have paid the money, or the uh they wanted to change over to a different model or something like that so lot of seconds solar modules are uh, available and i know one company in bangalore he is dealing only with seconds solar modules and uh, uh, how well he is doing uh, i do not know but then we can see any makes of solar modules are available with him but then if there is a system where some authenticated agency can certify this product is also still good to use something like that that type of certification is there so people will be interested in buying the second module also so that they can use it for their application whereby it can be put to better use yeah thank you sir so we also have a question from sanjeev jain he has asked that they have installed large number of off grid solar plants and irrigation pumps but they are seeing that the the latter installations the derating of the solar module is very fast so the ones which have been installed recently are actually uh, underperforming i would say much worse than other the older ones any thoughts on this uh, actually can i take this question yes yes please please uh, actually solar modules uh, if you look at just look at it visually you cannot make out whether there is any defect in that there is it is going to perform well or something like that because uh, uh, if they would have uh, used uh, material that are not suitable for that application there may be a possibility of reduction in output or there may be micro cracks would have got developed on the solar cell which is not visible you cannot uh, you can not uh, uh, see it and then identify unless it is going through a particular test el test where you can clearly identify so if somebody is pushing uh, 
add product or not passed product quality rejected product to for this application this is a possibility okay okay so maybe mr sanjeev you could reach out uh, uh, privately to mr krishna for any other inputs on this i'll move to this question from mr rizwan how do we see the need for upskilling the stakeholders policy makers and financial institutions to have proper scheme formulation for the entrepreneurs uh who wants to take this uh dipali you want to comment on this yeah shobha okay shobha then mr devankar yeah 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 i think there is uh, I, I, again there's lot of learning from the market uh, uh, on how entrepreneurs have come up for plastic waste and e waste and the same model can be replicated a uh, lot of uh, i think responsibility lies with the manufacturers because they have made the product and uh, and uh, uh, an, uh, knowledge coming from them on training these entrepreneurs to be which part of the supply chain are you looking at collection are you looking at dismantling recycling i think that knowledge building sessions a center of excellence at a central level state level all of these i think are required now to collate uh, information required about totally about solar panel its its uh, its type its material its uh, cost its revenues etc so i think uh, manufacturers really need to tie up with uh, government bodies and push this uh, for this knowledge out it is going to build a, we need to build the new recycling ecosystem which is totally unequipped to handle uh, solar waste on, on just on this question even i want to just put a question out to mr krishna also being a manufacturer and with the epr rules uh, coming in now how is uh, mr krishna's organization ready for uh, uh, taking on the epr uh, regulations for uh, for so photovoltaic plants yeah i think uh, uh, manufacturers are definitely uh, concerned about uh, the recycling and their responsibility surely they are interested but all these years uh, the manufacturers have not been making uh, uh, good uh, profit for the uh, for the reason because there there were so much of competition from uh, outside the country for the solar module supply and all so they were not making but uh, for last two years onwards you can see every manufacturer is positive in nature he has got uh, good revenue he is making good profit and then he has intention to keep aside some fund for implementing this uh, uh, epr program okay thank you so i'll uh, this question from surubi rajgopal this is for uh, dr suresh uh, what are the current practices for disposal within the informal sector for non recyclable components for batteries specifically so how uh, how like you said even in the formal setup these are little dangerous to handle and dispose how bad is the situation in the informal sector so for informal sector everything is informal only nothing they are doing formally because their interest is only recovering the lead rest all it is going no regulation no follow up nothing else will do. even they are doing without licenses to remove the informal sector only now the epr is come into the act and everyone has to go with the epr to do the things so only by epr we can able to remove off or uh, prevent off every informal sectors bringing only the formal sectors can go for the recycling in the recycling to the guidelines we need to clearly make it should be 100% material should be recycled back not only the value material once ev battery comes even it is a challenging one in ev battery irrespective of uh, if you can take comparatively lithium is the cheaper metal cobalt is the highly costliest metal so people will concentrate only on the cobalt leaving lithium that is also a challenging one so we need to go on there are different uh, process of pyro process is there hydro process is there pyro process is the costlier process hydro process is the cheapest process in hydro you can able to recovery back only cobalt in pyro you can able to recovery everything lithium also lithium also 
So in this case, which one we need to go? What is the regulation is going to come? So that is what the insistence should be. 100% of the material should be recycled back. Or otherwise, what is happening finally, whatever the non-recyclable material, we are sending to landfill. The one way of material we are manufacturing, uh, one way of we are making as the waste, the other way of we are contaminating by saying as landfill and which is going into the landfill. In landfill, these metals are not degradable. Again, it will be there even after 20 years of landfill life also. So we need to be thinking of maximum on the recycling basis rather than sending to the landfill basis. Okay, sir. Thank you. One final question we will take. It is from Arul Prasad. Uh, maybe Dipali, you can answer. He is asking who will be responsible for waste generated for the imported solar panels? So does EPR cover basically imported guys? Very much. You know, I think uh, in the e-waste rules as well, it's very clearly mentioned that anyone who is the first point or uh, responsible organization, person, whatever, bringing that product into the Indian market is considered as the producer. It does not matter whether you actually not have the factory to manufacture it, but if you are bringing it onto the market, if you are the point of import, then it is your responsibility. So, um, so it's not the manufacturer in China, but definitely the importer, the distributor, the developer, whoever is bringing that product or who will be then responsible under EPR. They will be considered the producer. It's, it's standard, uh, you know, very, very well accepted uh, now in EPR legislation. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very well. So I will uh, close with this uh, because we have just, uh, you know, five minutes to closing time uh, and a very interesting discussion. I have a full page of uh, questions to go back to the panelists with uh, and we look forward to organizing follow up uh, workshops because many interesting points have come from this. Uh, and if the audience also have specific inputs on what they would like to be discussed further, uh, feel free to write to the Selco ID, which Ruam has just shared on the chat. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody, panelists definitely, and also the audience uh, for staying with us on this topic. And we hope uh, more light can be thrown in the future session. Back to you, Rua. Thank you, Divya. Um, I would like to thank each of you, um, Dr. Dipali, Shobha, uh, Dr. Suresh, um, Jaru, Mr. Krishna, and uh, Divya and Archana uh, for moderating and holding this together with us. Um, it was great to see the kind of engagement that came through. And I don't think one and a half hour is sufficient uh, considering the kind of expertise we have with us in house and the uh, interesting kind of answers that came with so many data points um, and uh, very valuable inputs. So we really uh, appreciate all of you for coming today and taking the time to share your insights with us. I think it makes a huge difference to the um, conversations that will be carried forward. And there's a lot of meat and a lot of food for thought to be taken forward, like Divya said. Um, so thank you once again, and thank you to the audience for asking us those questions and staying engaged. Thank you. Everyone then, have a lovely thank day. Thank you, Ruam. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.